Ah, oh, Venice. The city is like no other. Since its beginning, it quickly became a center of influence and power. Its many waterways and canals slowly reveal its glorious past. Today, it's a must-see destination for tourists from around the globe. Venice, in medieval times, was one of the most important ports in the Mediterranean and had an influence on the wine trade. Later, as the region developed its own winemaking culture, Veneto adopted a Greek technique of making wines from dried grapes, called a passimento. This continues to be a factor that makes the wines from this region unique and extremely popular. The vineyards of the Veneto wine region are renowned for a family of wines. In ascending depth and body, they are Bardolino, Valpolicella, Ripasso, and Damarone. All members of this wine family start with the same blend of grapes, Corvina, Rondinella, and Molinara, picked at their peak of ripeness, and the best examples come from the hills of Valpolicella Classico. Ripasso is a Valpolicella wine that has been given more depth through a second fermentation using dried grapes, while Amarone is a product of the ancient winemaking method of Opacimento. Gargagnago is just in the center of the classic Valpolicella area. This is Dr. Sandro Boscaini, president at Mazzi Agricola, a leading producer in the region. The Apacimento process has been updated significantly since ancient times, relying on temperature and humidity controls to ensure quality. We start with the same grapes called Vina Rondinella Molinara, but we can uh, pick and, uh, and uh, crush fresh, making immediate fermentation, uh, now at the picking time, and we have Valpulicella. Then Valpulicella can be also aged and become Valpulicella Superiore, and is classico when it comes from the hillside area where we are now. Our vineyards, Masi, are totally in the classic area. Appassimento is totally made with the, the dry grapes, the same grapes, we pick at the same time now, and then when the grapes have lost 40% of the original weight, creating a severe concentration, and we have a totally dry wine, which is Amarone. Ah, the Amarone. Just south of Valpolicella is Verona, the city of love, the setting of Romeo and Juliet. I've come back here to look up an old love of my own, one I met many years ago, the famous Amarone. Music is everywhere in this historic city known for its love of opera. And this is one of its most famous landmarks. For hundreds of years, Antica Bottega del Vino has been home to artists, poets, and one of the greatest sellers in Italy. It's like a shrine to the great Italian vintages. Severino Barzan oversees the extensive collection. He too is captivated by the region's Amarones and loves to extol their virtues. Amarone was something special for the families. Not the one to drink every day, just for the special events, I mean, the family, you know, for Christmas. It's a special yeah. occasion. Special occasions. When I try Amarone, I know they're made from the same grapes, from the same area, but where do they get their character? This is terroir, the different terroir are gonna give you a lot more cherry, more peach, or body. It depends on the terroir, it depends on the soil, and depends on the philosophy of the winemaker, of the family. They can, I mean, 15 days more, 15 days less of drying them up, makes a difference. Tamarone. Tamarone. Salute. Salute. The Valpolicella region has it all. And here's a great example, the Valpolicella family. We start with Valpolicella, and you can see the density of color on each of these increases as we go up the range. Valpolicella, Ripasso, and Amarone. 
All three of these wines are made from the same grapes, but as we go up the family tree, you'll see that color density increases, as does the flavor characteristics. With Valpolicella, we have lighter bodied fruity wines with wonderful cherry, little bit of spice. As we get into Ripasso, because of the drying process, these are a little more intense, rounder on the mouth, more concentrated flavors, all the way up to Amarone. And these are complex wines with plummy cherry fruit, earthy characteristics and spice. These are ideal for braised meats and strong cheeses. The alpine meadows of Alto Adige seem a world away from the rest of Italy. Over the years, the white wines from this region have been miscast as lightweights, but their reputation is changing. The air is fresh, crisp and clean. That same description could be used for the wines of the area. We're in Italy's most northern wine growing region, at the 46th parallel to be exact and vineyards are planted up to a thousand meters above sea level. However, in the summertime, these narrow alpine valleys trap the heat and temperatures can exceed 30 degrees Celsius. When the fall harvest concludes, the winery team at Alois Legadar assembles in the vineyards to rejuvenate the soil. They adhere to the principles of biodynamics, the most holistic form of organic viticulture. Alois Legadar, fifth generation owner of the winery is committed to sustainable production. We lost in the last 200 years a biological balance we have in the free world, in the free nature, in the forest. So uh, what we are trying to achieve to bring back the plant, the vine, to this uh, balance. Developed in the 1920s by Rudolf Steiner, an Austrian philosopher and social reformist, Biodynamic production seeks to heal and revitalize the earth using natural techniques. Buried manure will ferment in cow horns and in months to come will be extracted and then sprayed on the vineyards. This region was once part of Austria, known as South Tyrol. And you can still see these influences today. I think we have the natural conditions to produce wines with great elegance. The acidity is there, but it's well integrated in the body, and the body is, is well structured. We have a good complexity. And so the wines are also round and soft without having any residual sugar. The Alto Adige area produces a range of white wines. And here are three great examples. We have a Pinot Grigio, a Riesling, and Gewürztraminer. All three are much richer and more complex than you might expect for white wines of Italy. Let's look at the Pinot Grigio. Beautiful straw gold with light green tints on the edge. Wonderful varietal characteristics on the nose and you get that minerality. Mm. On the palate, it's really quite rich and complex. Real creamy long finish. You could actually age this wine for another four to six years. But if you want to enjoy it, try it with roasted white meats or shellfish. In contrast to style, these vineyards in the neighboring region of Friuli can produce wines with a more contemplative side, expressing not only the purity of the fruit, but also the philosophy of the winemaker. In Italy's extreme northeast, the region of Friuli shares a border with Austria to the north and Slovenia to the east. The wines of these hills did not receive much attention until the modernization movement, which began in the 1960s. A handful of innovators, like the Yermann family, embraced technology, temperature controlled fermentation, to preserve the fresh and subtle fruit flavors of white varieties like Frugliano, Traminer, and Pinot Grigio. These vineyards are meticulously managed, a clear indication of quality production. However, the character of the fruit changes dramatically from the flat areas to the steep hillside plots. Michele Yerman explains. In, uh, in the flat it's more acidity, it's more uh, freshness of the wines, and here it's more structure, it's more body, it's more uh, passion inside the wines. Four generations of talent and passion have resulted in an excellent value and quality in these great northern whites. Friuli is known for producing white wines. Usually they're lighter, easy to drink. 
But there's another end of that spectrum, and Dreams is a great example. Deep, golden, you know this wine has spent time in wood. On the nose, it's powerful. You get the vanilla, you get the nuttiness, and that lovely toastiness coming through. Mm. Rich, creamy on the palate, wonderful acidity, beautifully balanced, which is a hallmark of a quality white wine. This wine will sell her for another eight or 10 years, or if you want to drink it now, have it with lobster thermidor. Here in Northern Italy, as we get closer to the Alps, the climate is generally cooler. And where you find cool climate winemaking, there's usually a thriving sparkling wine scene. Asti was my first introduction to Italian sparkling, but I want to show you Prosecco, brimming with melon and citrus and loved across the globe. It's easy to see why. There's a freshness that I find captivating. At the same time, it's casual. There's no pretension and it's great value. The grape variety is Glatum. Today, Prosecco is usually done in a dry or off-dry style, and it's no wonder it's becoming the world's most popular sparkling wine. This is the valley of Cartice, where the finest Glera grapes are grown. Prosecco wines are produced under DOC, DOCG, and Cru designations for the grapes that come from the south-faced hillsides in the Cartice. Antonio Motoran is general manager at Carpeni Malvolte. People here, 100 years ago, they were poor. But after, they discovered that it was possible to produce here a very interesting wine. And today, you see, there are some total mountains covered by vines. It's vines everywhere. Everywhere. In 2009, for the first time, Italy surpassed France as the leader in sparkling wine production, largely due to the popularity of Prosecco. Inexpensive and ideal as an aperitivo, Prosecco is made using the Charmat method. The young wine is re-fermented in these pressurized tanks and meant to be consumed young and fresh. Antonio, help me understand what people love so much about this wine. It's very easy to drink. For example, champagne is fantastic sparkling wine. A lot of parfums is complicated. Prosecco is very easy. People like to be happy, to have a not complicated life. When you drink Prosecco, you drink a little of Italy. We're not finished with sparkling wine yet. Beyond Prosecco and Asti, in the territory of Franci e Corta, just west of Veneto, is another of Italy's great but underappreciated wines. Beyond these gates at Ca del Bosco, a stunning symbol of the relationship between art and wine, is a technological wonder where they make one of the world's greatest sparkling wines. You have all of the ingredients, what more could you ask for? Yeah, we have to have your philosophy and concentrate it on the quality because uh, the winemaking is always secondary to the grapes. Franci e Corta became the first DOC to specify that its sparkling wines must be made by the Metodo Classico. The method of sparkling wine production where the second fermentation must take place in the bottle. The stony soils planted with Chardonnay, Pinot Bianco and Pinot Nero produce wines that are dry, elegant and poised. To put the vine in a difficult position in order to be always a little bit suffering, uh, because suffering the vine produce better uh, and produce less. The roots with this kind of soil they are obliged to go deeper and going deeper they eat better. When picked they're fermented in at least 16 separate batches. The base wines are then blended to form a cuvee. The all-important second fermentation takes place in bottles in the underground cellars. The wine then rests on the yeast for a very long period, at least six and a half years, until it's disgorged to remove the yeast and then recorked. When we think about the sparkling wines of Italy, the prestige cuvées of Franci Corta can stand shoulder to shoulder with the best sparkling wines in the world. 
Here we have the Anna Maria Clemente. Look at that beautiful deep golden color, much richer than we saw from Prosecco. The nose is really intense, lots of ripe apple, spice, toastiness, and just a hint of oak. Mm. Much richer and creamier than Prosecco. Really intense and complex flavors on the palate. Again, you get that apple, toast, a little bit of smokiness and a touch of oak. Beautiful long finish. It's said that the best wines are a true expression of place, and that's certainly the case in Piemonte, where success in wine growing is determined by subtle differences through the locations across these hillsides. For wine lovers around the world, these hills represent the promised land, Barolo and Barbarasco. Over the centuries, these vineyards have been parceled according to their relationship to the sun, and this slope is one of the best in Barbarasco called El Brico. This is Cesare Benvenuto, from the winery of Pio Cesare. El Brico means, uh, in our own dialect, the, the peak of the hill, so in fact... It's right on top. Yes, it's really the peak of the hill, uh, of this hill of the Barbaresco area. And thanks to this 100% uh, self-exposure, we can grow such a uh, great Nebbiolo bunches of grape. It's a very light-colored grape. It's almost translucent. Yes, this is a, one of the reasons why we have a, a very uh, a long maceration with the skin contact. And the skin is a, a very important uh, uh, matter for, uh, for, uh, for Nebbiolo because, as you can see here, you see here, yeah. you can have a look over here, is the skin of Nebbiolo is very, very thin. It's very thin. Uh, and as much as uh, uh, contact with, uh, with the sun, you can uh, have uh, the the best quality. So with and such with such a thin-skinned grape, how do you get such color extract in the wine? Because uh, the color is very is very light, but uh, thanks to the sun, thanks to the soil, and thanks to this uh, almost 28, 30 days of uh, maceration with the skin content, we can have uh, such a great color also on the Barolo and Barbaresco. The origins of its name are somewhat unknown. Maybe it's the veil of fog that forms over the maturing berries. Nebbia is Italian for fog, or the word nobile, meaning noble in English. In either case, Nebbiolo is synonymous with quality. Prized by collectors for its long age ability, it's not uncommon for some Barolos to sell her for 30 or 40 years. There's no doubt that Nebbiolo is one of the great varieties of Italy if not the world. In the wine business, Barolo and Barbaresco are very well known for the unbelievable aging potential. In fact, at the first sight, it's a little bit, it's a little bit tannic, uh, with a very nice acidity. But uh, step by step, uh, when you uh, taste Barolo many times, or Barbaresco many times, you will be totally uh, conquested by uh, the great flavor of uh, this unique grape variety. The region of Piemonte sits in northwestern Italy along the French-Swiss border. The growing areas for the great wines of Barolo and Barbaresco are centered around the town of Alba. These are not big wines in the same sense as a California Cabernet or Australian Shiraz. The powerful structure and high alcohol of Nebbiola wines impacts an impression of strength and weight. And the finest examples? They show balance, elegance, and an emphasis on perfume and spice that's really hard to sum up in one word. <laughs> Michele Chiarlo is another of the region's accomplished producers, and he's a man who's intimately acquainted with his land. Today he's on a hunt. <laughs> This dog was selected from many for his exceptional nose and specially trained to locate the rarest and most expensive food on earth. The elusive white truffle of Alba. 
Well done. <laughs> Cherished by chefs around the globe, they sell for over $5,000 per kilo. And like the great wines, people will pay for the best. Uh, we'll eat well tonight. <laughs> this region grows other grapes like Barbera and Dolcetto, but Michele focuses on one varietal that reaches its pinnacle in the soils he knows best. So this is all Barolo here. All Barolo area, it is the most prestigious area, it is the most prestigious single vineyard. It's really a small area too. Very small area. It is uh, 1,800 hectares. For decades now, a feud has been brewing in these hills between the so-called modernists and traditionalists over the Barolo style. The modern approach seeks to make wines fruitier and younger drinking by shortening skin contact and fermentation, reducing aging time, and using more French barrique casks instead of the large oak bote. Tasting these young Barolos with Michele and his son Stefano, it's clear they represent the best of both worlds. Modern technique rooted in tradition. I discovered Barolo 60 years ago. Because Barolo it is a great surprise. But uh, my great surprise is to taste the Barolo when you have 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Every time you have a great evolution. The bouquet, but it remains always very fresh bouquet. Very fresh, complex, with a lot of character. When he started young, he is more fruity. When he arrived at uh, 10 years, you have more spices. If you put in front of you a glass of Barolo, you taste it for one hour consecutive, you discover always the new sensation. For me, this is a complexity. Let's try two great wines from Piemonte, Barbaresco and Barolo. Barbaresco is known as the queen. Both of these wines are made from the same grape variety, Nebbiolo. We look at this beautiful garnet color, on the nose, you get a lot of deep forest fruit, like blackberries, blueberries, spice, leather. Quite full-bodied, but really silky. It's beautifully integrated. This is probably the more versatile of the two wines. It's great with game, it's great with lighter meats, and it's fantastic with aged cheeses. The King, Barolo, made from Nebbiolo, Beautiful garnet color. One of the things to remember with Barolo is these wines can change dramatically when they're grown from vineyards that are just meters apart. This example has got wonderful blueberry, blackberry, spice, leather, and mint leaf. In the mouth, it's a really complex, extremely well-structured wine. This is a wine that needs time. Not only does it take time to create, it needs time in the cellar to really evolve. It's not the wine for the beginner, but it is certainly one to satisfy the collector. Our journey ends here in Milano. And like the rest of Italy, there's both beauty and style. It occurs to me that a wine label is as important as a label on a designer's dress. In both cases, it carries the brand image. We want to know the origin, and we want to know the story. As we've seen, the story of Italian wine spans the centuries. The history, wine regulations, label terms, and diverse range of styles can be intimidating. To those of us who love them, if you can invest a little time and some effort to understand them, it can be the start of a beautiful relationship.